Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of Louise Smith. She was a young and beautiful teenage girl who in December of 1995 was looking forward to the festive season and spending time with her family. However, before Christmas Day even really began, Louise disappeared and a police investigation was quickly set up to try and find her. But it would be a number of weeks before there was any development or news in the case. And unfortunately, it wasn't the news that everyone was hoping for. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a massive thank you to Amazon Music for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Amazon Music is my absolute favourite music streaming platform. I literally use it every single day without fail. It has thousands and thousands of music stations and top playlists which you can stream for free. However, if you would like to listen to your music on demand and without the interruption of ads, then I highly, highly recommend you you try Amazon Music Unlimited. That way you'll get unlimited access to more than 75 million songs and you can listen to any song, anywhere, anytime, offline with unlimited skips. One of my favourite playlists to listen to at the moment is this one called Rediscover Adele. I absolutely love Adele's voice. I think it's just beautiful and this playlist I think has all of her best songs on it so I've been playing it on repeat. I was just listening to it actually whilst I was getting ready to film this and setting up my equipment. But Amazon Music isn't just for listening to your favourite songs, you can also listen to podcasts. In fact it has more than 10 million free podcast episodes to listen to. A podcast that I have just discovered actually and have been listening to non-stop is Alan Carr's Life's a Beach podcast. I adore Alan Carr, I think he's absolutely hilarious so when I found out that he had a podcast, I was straight onto Amazon Music to listen. He just makes me laugh so much. I recently listened to the episode where he had Michael McIntyre on as a guest. I was listening to it in the car yesterday and I just loved it. I can't get enough and I'm making my way through the rest of the episodes. I use Amazon Music the most when I am driving. Um, I also use it when I'm out walking my dogs. I just listen to it on my phone with my headphones in. But I also like to listen to it on our Alexa. We have an Alexa in the kitchen so myself and my sister are always listening to our favourite songs on it whilst we are cooking and I'm not ashamed to say that most of the time we are listening to the Mamma Mia album such iconic songs. So if you would like to give Amazon Music a go, then right now is the time to do it because for a limited time, new customers can try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months and no credit card is required. All you have to do is go to amazon.com slash molly. Once again, that's amazon.com slash molly to try Amazon Music Unlimited free for three months. Thank you so, so much to Amazon Music once again for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel and now let's just get into the case. So for today's case we are going back to the year 1995 in the southwest of England, specifically in Yate, which is a town in South Gloucestershire. It's about 11 miles away from Bristol city centre and this is Louise Smith. She was an 18 year old girl who lived in Yate with her family. Louise was born in 1977. Her parents were called Robert and Jill Smith and they were 49 and 48 years old and Louise was one of two children children. She had a brother called Richard who was about two years older than her. He was 20. Louise's father Robert described his daughter, who he often just called Lou, as being a very fiery and loyal and trustworthy and just nice young girl who had a lot of friends that she loved spending time with. Her mother Jill said that Louise was very much into music growing up. In particular, she really loved Fred Astaire. She just adored him so 
much. Jill actually said that Louise was so heartbroken when Fred Astaire passed away in 1987 and she cried for hours and hours when she found out. But Louise was also very much into musicals. She loved musical theatre. She was very intelligent and bright and bubbly and just a very beautiful young girl. She was tall, she had this gorgeous red hair and I think she was just your typical teenage girl growing up in the 90s. She enjoyed going out with friends and having fun and she now enjoyed going into the world of work as an adult. You see Louise left school at 16 years old and when she did she started a job in an office in Yates and according to her father Robert she really really liked this job. She liked earning her own money and having her independence. When it was coming towards the end of 1995 Louise Smith was getting so excited for the festive season. She was looking forward to Christmas and giving everyone the presents that she had bought and just spending time with her friends and family. And on Christmas Eve of 1995, so the 24th of December, Louise had made plans to go out with a couple of her friends. They were going to go out in Yates Town, go to some bars and clubs and have a couple of drinks and just celebrate. Celebrate the fact that Christmas had arrived and a new year was soon to begin. So that evening, her father Robert dropped Louise at a friend's house before he and his wife Jill went out themselves. They went out with a few of their friends too. Louise and her friends went to a nightclub called Spirals that evening, which was actually very close to Louise's home. It was less than a mile away. So she was out partying, drinking, dancing, just having fun with her friends until eventually she left the nightclub in the early hours of the morning and decided that she was ready to go back home. However, Louise Smith never actually made it home that night. When her father, Robert, woke up at 8.30 a.m. the next morning, so this was Christmas Day morning, he walked out of his bedroom and he noticed that Louise's bedroom door was open, which he was quite surprised about, I think, because he wasn't expecting Louise to be awake yet. She had been out drinking and clubbing the night before, so he did not think that she would be up at this time. He thought that she would want to sleep in. So he walked up to Louise's door, he knocked on it and just kind of poked his head round. And when he did, he realised that Louise wasn't in her bedroom and her bed looked as though it hadn't even been slept in indicating that she never came home the previous night. Her parents, Robert and Jill, didn't really panic too much at first. They just assumed that Louise had probably stayed around at a friend's house or something like that. They didn't immediately jump to the worst case scenario. So they waited for about half an hour, thinking that any minute now Louise would just turn up but she didn't. And so they picked up the phone and they started ringing a couple of Louise's friends to see if she was with them, if she had stayed at one of theirs last night. But they all said no. They had no idea where Louise was. And it was at this point that alarm bells really started to ring for Robert and Jill Smith. The only explanation they could think of as to why Louise didn't come home was that maybe she was at a friend's house. But all of her friends that she was with that night were saying that they didn't know where Louise was. She wasn't with them. So they really started to worry. And at around 11am that morning, they decided to contact the Avon and Somerset police and report their daughter as missing. Thankfully, the police immediately jumped into action. An officer went straight to the Smiths' home. They spoke to Robert and Jill about what their daughter Louise had been doing the previous night. And this officer also conducted a quick search of their family home, which I believe is something that the police have to do at the start of any missing persons case. Just check that the missing person isn't actually in their home. And of course, in this case, Louise wasn't. So inquiries immediately began to try and find Louise Smith. And of course, her parents were just absolutely beside themselves with worry. I can't even imagine on Christmas Day of all days how frightening this must have been for them. I mean, Christmas for them was just 
cancelled as soon as Louise was reported as missing. They cancelled all of their plans. They had arranged to go over to Jill's sister's house for Christmas lunch. So they obviously cancelled that and they just stayed home all day praying that Louise would turn up soon. As soon as a missing persons investigation was set up, the first thing that the police obviously needed to determine were Louise's last steps the night before. So when was she last seen? What time was she last seen? Whereabouts was she? Was she with anyone? Stuff like that. They needed to build a picture of her last known movements. Well, obviously they knew by this time that she had spent the evening in Spirals nightclub in Yates shopping centre and so they straight away started looking through the nightclub CCTV footage. They had a CCTV camera pointed at the entrance, the door to Spirals, so they could see everyone going in the nightclub and everyone coming out. So the police actually brought Louise's father Robert down to the nightclub the day after she was reported as missing so this was Boxing Day and they asked Robert if he could just watch the footage and let them know if slash when he spotted his daughter on it and eventually he spotted her. He spotted Louise coming out of the nightclub sometime around 1 30 to 2 a.m on Christmas Day morning. She was on her own in the footage so she left the club on her own but she looked completely normal she was walking fine so it didn't appear as though she was really really drunk she didn't look upset or nervous or anything like that she looked fine the police quickly tracked down the majority of people mostly young people that had also been in the nightclub that evening and they were asked if they knew anything about Louise's whereabouts if they knew where she was or where she went that night but they didn't really have any information that progressed the inquiry. However, the police did receive information from a couple of Louise's friends who said that they saw her after she left the nightclub walking through a car park past a burger van. Some online sources even say that she got food from this burger van. And this car park was near Spiral's nightclub and it was in the direction of Louise's home. They saw her speaking to a couple of people as she walked through the car park but she continued walking on her own towards her house so that indicates that she did plan on going home after this it didn't seem as though she had made other plans elsewhere she was heading home after she left the club and the walk from the club to her home would have only taken roughly eight minutes so something must have happened to Louise at some point along that eight minute journey. From the point where she was last seen walking through the car park and her house, something happened to her along that route. It was considered at the start of the investigation that maybe Louise had gotten into some kind of accident that night, like perhaps she was involved in a car accident. Maybe a vehicle hit her and she was injured or something, although that theory seemed very unlikely when the police got in contact with all of the local hospitals and they they all said that they had no record of a Louise Smith being there. Another theory that was put forward in the beginning was that maybe Louise had decided to commit suicide that night. Maybe after she left Spiral's nightclub, she went somewhere to take her own life. But again, that was another theory that was pretty quickly ruled out because there was absolutely no indication that that was something that Louise was thinking about doing. Of course, you can't always tell whether someone might be feeling that way but her family were adamant. They said that Louise was happy. She was happy in her social life, in her work life, she was looking forward to Christmas and her father Robert said that Louise had even made plans for New Year's Eve already. She was actually going to go back to Spiral's nightclub on New Year's Eve. So the theory that she had done something to herself also seemed highly highly unlikely. As the days went by everyone fears for Louise's safety and well-being just grew enormously. It seemed as though there was no reasonable explanation as to why Louise had disappeared. No one could work out what had happened. It was so, so unlike Louise 
to do something like this so out of her character and so people did quickly start fearing the worst they feared that something very sinister had happened to the 18 year old and that Louise hadn't just gone missing of her own accord in the days after Louise's disappearance the police had appealed to the public for information and to also spread awareness of Louise's case but they put missing posters in the local area near where she vanished they put missing posters in New newspapers. However, about three days after she was reported as missing, the police held a television conference in which they pleaded for members of the public to come forward if they knew anything about Louise Smith's whereabouts. And during this conference, Louise's father Robert and her older brother Richard also spoke and they pleaded for witnesses to come forward. I've got some quotes here from Robert Smith from his appeals and he said, Louise has never left home before which makes it all the more worrying there was no reason why she should leave we all love her we're missing her and we want her back he also appealed directly to his daughter just in case there was any chance that she was out there and she was watching the conference and he said louise we all love you please get in touch by any means we want you back and after watching this television conference and upon hearing the news of louise's disappearance the public were all just completely devastated for the Smith family. I think it really resonated with a lot of families, a lot of parents especially because it's the worst thing that any parent can imagine your child going missing and I touched on this earlier but the fact that it happened at Christmas time as well just hit people even harder because Christmas is about family, it's about spending time with the people that you love and here was this family whose world had been completely turned upside down and destroyed at a time of year when they should be the happiest. So a lot of people really really felt for the Smith family and they wanted to do as much as they possibly could to help with the investigation. The local community really came together in this case and the main way that they helped was actually with the police searches for Louise. Literally thousands and thousands of people volunteered to assist with the outdoor searches. They were searching fields and woodland areas for any trace of the young girl. Even people that weren't local were showing up to help. They had people travel up from Somerset, from Wales even. These were all people that had heard or read about Louise's disappearance in the media and on the news and just wanted to help in any way that they could but unfortunately despite people's best efforts no trace of Louise was found and weeks started to pass. The police were of course still working on this investigation tirelessly but there weren't really any big developments. They still had absolutely no idea what happened to Louise Smith that late night in December. But that was all about to change in February of 1996 when the news that everyone had been dreading broke. Over seven weeks after Louise Smith went missing on the 17th of February 1996, two teenage boys, they were about 13 years old, were hanging out and playing in a quarry in Chipping Sobbury, which is a town in South Gloucestershire and it's probably about a mile away from Yates where Louise disappeared from. And this quarry was apparently quite a popular hangout amongst teenagers and young people at the time, so these two teenage boys were just playing in the quarry they were throwing and kicking some footballs around and as they were doing this one of their footballs rolled into a hedge or some undergrowth or something so they went to find it and get it out however whilst they were looking for the ball they noticed something on like a slope kind of halfway down the quarry and it was a bit concealed so I think it took them a few moments to really realize what it was but eventually they knew this was a dead human body that they had found on the quarry. So the police were immediately contacted and they went straight to the scene. They went to the area where the boys spotted the body lying. It was located about 15 feet down the quarry slope and you could tell by looking at the body that the decomposition process had begun. So it had probably been there for some time. The body was that of a woman 
and she was found naked. So naturally the police instantly believed that this woman was missing teenager Louise Smith. But obviously due to the decomposition they couldn't confirm this until DNA tests had been conducted. Before the body was taken away for a post-mortem a forensic team was sent to the crime scene to collect any potential evidence and this discovery of a body very very quickly reached the public and the media and just like the police naturally everyone believed instantly that this had to be Louise Smith and what's absolutely awful is that before the police even had a chance to tell Louise's family about this discovery themselves a reporter knocked on the Smith's front door and when Louise's father Robert answered it the reporter just said did you know a body's just been found and just as he said it the police pulled up outside the home they were just about to deliver the news to the family but this reporter got there before them which just honestly sickens me this reporter was clearly desperate to get there before the police and get Louise's family's first reaction to that horrible news it's disgusting but following this the police sat down with Robert and Jill Smith and they told them that whilst the identity of the body had not been 100% confirmed yet they did believe that it was probably their daughter and eventually it was confirmed through fingerprints that the body found at the quarry was indeed 18 year old Louise Smith. It's believed that Louise's body had been there in the quarry since her disappearance so whilst the police and everyone was out looking for her hoping to find her alive she was dead and her body was in the quarry and chipping Sobbury that whole time but I think the reason it took so long to find her was because she was actually quite well hidden whoever had done this to Louise had tried to conceal her body obviously they were hoping that it would never be found like I mentioned she was discovered on like a ledge about 15 feet down the quarry slope but the pathologist concluded that she hadn't fallen down onto the ledge someone had placed her there it was also determined that Louise had been raped so this crime seemed to be sexually motivated and I'm not actually 100% sure if the pathologist was able to determine a cause of death or not because different sources say different things on that. Some online sources say that they couldn't determine a cause of death due to the fact that she had been dead for several weeks and therefore she had started to decompose whereas other sources state that her cause of death was asphyxiation from strangulation and an article that I read that was written by Louise's father Robert did state that said that she had been strangled so I'm not sure what was actually stated on her death certificate but now that Louise's body had been found and they knew that she had been murdered the hunt was on to find her killer and get some answers and justice for Louise's family. So to kick start the search for the perpetrator the police firstly put together a profile of their killer what kind of person they believed this killer was. They obviously believed that the killer was a male and they believed it was a young-ish male because they would have needed to have been very physically fit and strong in order to place Louise's body in the location where it was found on the quarry. And the police also theorised that the killer had to be a local, or at least they knew the area very well because they knew that the quarry in Chipping Sodbury was a good place to hide her. I mean, she wasn't found for seven weeks, and had it not been for those two teenage boys... Who knows how much longer it would have taken for her to be discovered. Alongside creating this profile of the offender, the police were also still conducting interviews. They were questioning people, taking statements, etc. However, what they were really hoping was that forensic and DNA technology would prove to provide their biggest lead in this case. They were hoping that DNA would lead them straight to the murderer. But of course, you have to bear in mind that this was 1996 
2006 when DNA and forensics was still in its early stages, early years, and therefore definitely not as good as it is today. So the police were worried that scientists wouldn't be able to find anything, any trace of the killer's DNA on Louise's body, especially because her body had been on the quarry for several weeks. So there is a high chance that any DNA that was previously present on the body would have gone by now. It could have been washed off by the rain, animals or wildlife could have disturbed the body and therefore tampered any DNA that was present. Although surprisingly, Louise's body was actually kind of well preserved during the time that it was on the quarry. Obviously she had started to decompose because she had been there for several weeks, but due to how cold it was at the time in December, how low temperatures were, she was actually quite well preserved. So scientists took samples from Louise's remains hoping to find any trace of the killer's DNA and by some miracle, they did. They were able to pick up traces of the killer semen, I believe, on her body from where Louise had been raped. So this was a huge, huge development in the case and a massive relief for the police because it meant that if they had any future people of interest or suspects in the investigation, they could take their DNA, test it against the killers and see if it was a match. Now today, in 2021, the police would obviously be able to take a DNA sample and enter it into the DNA database to see if there was a match to it. But back then in 1996, I believe the DNA database in the UK had literally just been established. So there weren't millions and millions and millions of DNA profiles on it like there are now. So to try and find a match to the killer's DNA in this case, the police's plan was to basically try and get a sample of DNA from literally every single male in the local area and surrounding areas and then testing every single sample against the murderer's DNA. And this is a process known as mass DNA screening and this case, Louisa's case, was actually the first time this technique, mass DNA screening, was ever used in the UK in a murder inquiry. As you would expect, the very first people that the police wanted to take samples from were like sex offenders in the area and other criminals, in particular ones that were either in or around the Spirals nightclub on the night that Louise went missing and was killed. They took samples from anyone with any kind of history of violence and aggression and also at the top of the list to test were just the people in Louise's life. Anyone that knew her personally was tested in case she was killed by someone that she knew. So they were testing the people at the top of the list first, people that seemed more likely to be capable of committing a crime like this, and then gradually they would work their way down the list. And over the coming months, the number of people that they tested increased more and more and more. They were testing thousands and thousands of men, but when all of these were compared against the killer's DNA, they still couldn't find their match. Eventually, the police got to the point where they started kind of widening their search. So, like I mentioned, at first they were testing known criminals and sex offenders, um, people that knew Louise, but when those samples were tested and none of them were a match, that's when the police took the DNA search a step up. Their next port of call was to test anyone that lived along the route that Louise would have walked that night to get home, and also anyone that was just seen along that route. For example, anyone that was seen in the car park close to Spiral's nightclub, because we know that Louise walked through that car park that night. But they didn't just want to test the people that were in the car park around the time that Louise would have walked through it. They wanted to test all of the men that were just in the car park at all that night. So at any point in the night, if they were in that car park, the police wanted to take their DNA. So the police started going through their list of all of the men that they had been informed had been in the car park that night and they approached them and asked them to provide a DNA sample. And one of these men in particular ultimately stood out to the police because Basically, they had asked him to provide a DNA sample and he was happy to do so. He was willing to provide his DNA and they arranged a date with him to come and collect it. However, when that day eventually came around a few weeks later and the police knocked on his door to take his DNA, 
he wasn't there, it turns out that this man had left the country and he hadn't told the police. So naturally, at this point, alarm bells are ringing. This seemed very suspicious to the police, so they started looking at this guy a little bit more as a potential suspect. So just for a little bit of context here, this man's name was David Frost. He was 22 years old and he was a civil engineering student. He attended the University of Guildford in Surrey, however his parents lived in Yate in the southwest of England the same area where Louise Smith lived and disappeared from. And at the time of her murder, the end of December 1995, David was spending Christmas at home in Yate with his family. And it turns out that on the night that Louise Smith was killed, David was actually out in Yate partying and drinking and he tried to go into Spiral's nightclub. However, the security at Spiral's wouldn't actually let him in because he was really, really drunk and I think he was showing a little bit of aggressive behaviour maybe, so yeah, he wasn't allowed in. But all of this was captured on the CCTV camera from outside the nightclub and then later on that evening he was seen walking through the car park near the nightclub at around 3am. The same car park that Louise Smith walked through. So for these reasons he was on the police's list of men to take DNA samples from, although he wasn't high on the list or anything because David didn't didn't have any criminal record, he had never been involved with the police before. He just seemed like any other normal young man in his early 20s. He had friends, he was at uni, he was actually doing really well at uni, he was very intelligent. But regardless, due to the fact that he was seen near the nightclub and in the car park that night, he was eventually contacted by the police and asked to give his DNA. And as I said a minute ago, he said yes, he was happy to do that, although I I believe at the time that he was approached and asked, he was actually at his university. He lived in a uni house in Surrey. But he told the Avon and Somerset police that he would be back in Yate in a few weeks time to see his family. So he said that he could meet with the police then to give his DNA. But when the police went to collect the sample from him a couple of weeks later, David wasn't there and they soon found out that he had actually gone to South Africa and he had gone to South Africa because he got a job there, he got a work placement with a civil engineering firm so he relocated there, which I suppose seems genuine. However, what really confused the police about this was the fact that he hadn't told them that. He knew that the police wanted his DNA sample, he knew that they were going to come calling and yet he just upped and left the country without telling them that he wouldn't be around to give it. And they started questioning why he hadn't told them. Did he just simply forget or something like that? Although it seems like, it doesn't seem like something you would forget, the police wanting your DNA. I guess there's a chance that he could have forgotten and so that's why he didn't tell them. Or maybe he didn't tell them because he was the killer that they were looking for and so he wanted to flee the country so that hopefully they wouldn't be able to get his DNA. All of this just made David Frost appear very suspicious and so the police knew that they had to get his DNA sample as soon as they could just in case he was responsible for what happened to Louise that night. And so to do this, the Avon and Somerset police actually got in contact with the police all the way over in South Africa, where David Frost was now living. And they asked the South African police if they would be able to get David's DNA sample and then send it back to them in England. And the South African police agreed. They went to David's new work at the civil engineering firm. They took his DNA and they sent it back to England and as soon as the police received it they sent it off for testing and when the results came back it was a match. It was a match to the semen that was discovered on Louise's dead body 
22-year-old David Frost was Louise Smith's killer. The police had finally identified him after months and months and months of searching. I believe the match was made in April of 1997, so about 14 months after Louise was raped and murdered and her body left on the quarry. And the scientists that tested this sample actually concluded that the chances of the DNA on Louise's body belonging to anyone other than David Frost was one in 35 million. So that was very, very strong evidence against him. That was an identification. He was the monster that did this to Louise. So now that they had their guy, the police's next step was to, of course, arrest him. But this would prove to be very, very difficult in this case because David Frost was in South Africa. And the police in South Africa couldn't arrest him for Louise's murder because it didn't happen in their country. But equally, the police in England couldn't just extradite David Frost back to the UK because from what I can understand, the UK didn't have an extradition treaty with South Africa at this time in 1997. The UK's extradition act didn't come into force until a couple of years later in 2003-2004 time. So he couldn't be extradited and the Avon and Somerset police couldn't just go over to South Africa and arrest him because they had no legal authority over there to do that, no jurisdiction. So the police's only option was to go out to South Africa, speak to David Frost and somehow try to convince him to willingly come back to England with them, try to convince this killer to come back to his home country so that he could be arrested and charged for what he did to Louise. Obviously this was going to be a long shot but it was the only shot the police had. This was all they could really do so they had to try it. So a couple of the detectives working on Louise's case flew over to South Africa and they went to see David Frost. They sat down with him, they told him the situation that they couldn't actually do anything, they couldn't arrest him here in South Africa because they had no legal authority to do so. But they said that they had come to see him because they had DNA evidence to indicate that he was the one who killed 18 year old Louise Smith back in December of 1995. And so because of this, they wanted to know if he would voluntarily come back to England with them so that all of this could be sorted out. And unbelievably, after speaking to a solicitor from Bristol over the phone, eventually David Frost agreed. He said that he would go back with the police and two days later they all flew back to England and the minute they were back, as soon as they landed actually at Heathrow Airport in London, David Frost was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Louise Smith. Following his arrest, Frost was taken to a police station to be questioned and when the police did question him, they were quite shocked at the kind of person that he was. He was polite, he was articulate, he was bright. They even described him as pleasant. He did not seem at all like a cold-blooded, heartless, evil person that would have been capable of taking a young girl's life in such a horrific way. But the evidence proved that he was. He was a cold-blooded killer and I suppose he was just good at hiding it. But anyway, they began questioning David Frost and at first he denied it. He said that he did see Louise on the night that she was killed and he did speak to her. He had a short conversation with her, but that was it. He said that he had nothing to do with her death. And I think he stuck to this story for a while, but eventually, as his interviews continued, he decided to add to it. He added quite a lot to it. David Frost was now saying that he did meet Louise that night. They started chatting, I believe, in the car park or somewhere near Spirals Nightclub. And during their conversation, they decided to go to the local quarry together where they were going to have sex. So he said that they walked to the quarry, they started having sex. However, he claimed that during it, 
Louise started to panic and she started to cry and scream and he said that she would just not calm down. He was trying to get her to relax and stop but she just wouldn't. She kept screaming and so that made him start to panic and during this panicked state that he was now in, David raised his hand and he put it over Louise's mouth to make her be quiet and he said that when he eventually removed his hand, Louise was now silent but not because she had calmed down because she was dead david claimed that he had accidentally suffocated louise to death and afterwards whilst he was still very panicky he just fled the scene and he left her body there at the quarry so whilst he was admitting that he was responsible for louise's death he said that it wasn't murder he didn't plan to kill her it was an accident which would make it a case of manslaughter However, the police and the majority of people, I think, do not believe that. They did not believe that this was manslaughter. They believed it was murder. Because if it really was an accident, if he really didn't mean to do this, why didn't he go to the police straight after? Why did he just leave her body there to decompose, making her poor family go through seven weeks, almost two months, of mental pain and torture because they had absolutely no idea where she was or what had happened to her or if she was safe. So despite David's version of events, the police still charged him with Louise's murder, meaning that if he was going to stick to his story, the case would have to go to trial. And he did stick to his story. At his plea hearing, David Frost entered a plea of not guilty and his trial was due to begin in February of 1998, over two Two years after Louise's murder. However, there was a shocking twist in this case when just the day before the trial was due to start, David Frost actually changed his plea. He now decided that he was going to plead guilty to murder. No one knows what made David Frost change his mind that day, but I think it's possible that he just realised that due to the evidence, it was very unlikely that the jury would believe his accident story. And so he may as well change his plea and hope for a lesser sentence for finally being honest. So because he pleaded guilty, the trial didn't have to go ahead. All that was left was for him to be sentenced. And for what he did to Louise, he was given life imprisonment. I have a quote here from the judge that sentenced David Frost. And they said, quote, it was an evil thing that you did in the early hours of Christmas Day two years ago, taking the life of Louise Smith. There is only only one sentence for murder and that is life imprisonment. Louise's family was so relieved when the life sentence was handed down to David Frost. However, very disappointingly, about 10 months later when it came to determining David Frost's minimum tariff, he was given 14 years. So his official sentence was life imprisonment with a minimum term of 14 years, which was just such a kick in the teeth for Louise's loved ones. The fact that there was a chance that he could have been out in 14 years. He stole Louise's future from her and yet if he was out in 14 years, he could still have a future of his own. Another huge kick in the teeth of the family was that the rape charge against David Frost was actually dropped. He was never convicted of Louise's rape. And I don't actually know why. I don't know the reason for this. I don't know if there was insufficient evidence, but yeah, it was dropped. So he was just sentenced for her murder. And David Frost is actually a free man now. He is no longer in prison. He served just over two years of his minimum sentence. So he served 16 years in total. So I believe he would have been released around 2014 time. And he would have probably been in his late 30s, early 40s when he was let out. So he still has a long life ahead of him which is something that Louise can never have because of his actions. We don't know exactly what happened that night in December of 1995 because David Frost has never told anyone. We don't know where the two exactly met because Louise didn't know David. She had never met him before that night. So we don't know if she willingly went with him to the quarry where she was later found dead or if he 
abducted her and forced her there. We don't know the events that led to what happened and I don't think we will ever know because the only person still alive that can tell us is David Frost and it's very very unlikely that he will ever do that now. After David's sentence Louise's parents Robert and Jill Smith actually expressed how they wanted to see the death penalty return to the UK. They said that before their daughter's murder they didn't agree with it but afterwards they were in so much pain that they wanted David to die for what he did, a life for a life. Louise's father Robert said quote if people opposed to the death penalty had seen our household and the misery David Frost has caused they would understand what we feel. But that is it for this case, that is the case of 18 year old Louise Smith, a very very sad case and I know I've said it but the fact that it happened on Christmas day as well is just awful. Louise's family have said that they don't even really celebrate Christmas now because of what happened, it's literally just something to get through for them because it's it's a constant reminder of Louise's murder, which is just so horrible. It must be so upsetting that whilst everyone else is partying and celebrating the festive season, they are just trying to get through it because it marks the anniversary of Louise's death. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. Um, also, let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you again next week for another Mystery with Molly. Bye!